Oh, so I came to Boston as an internal medicine resident and very quickly um, met people from Physicians for Human Rights in Boston. I started seeing asylum seekers in my practice um, when I was a resident in training. Um, and that work evolved and I was mentored and taught to use the Istanbul protocol by the giant Vince Iacopino um, and also um, Alejandro Moreno, uh, you know, a very, very important mentor to me. And that was back 20 years ago. Um, and I've been using the Istanbul protocol hundreds of times ever since um, in many, many different contexts. Um, asylum cases, cases of alleged police maltreatment, hunger strikes, and um, most recently in, in government sanctioned torture cases, such as what occurred after 9-11 um, in, the, in the CIA black sites and military detention centers. I was part of a PHR investigation called Broken Laws, Broken Lives. And we um, wrote a report back in 2008. And that was really um, the first report that was based off uh, Istanbul Protocol evaluations. It was the first evidence of the harm that was caused by United States interrogation techniques and men held in US detention, the very first report. Now, after that, I was actually engaged with PHR again to go visit um, a man in, in Africa who had been held at CIA black sites for five years, um, subsequently released a home with no charges ever against him. Um, and he had alleged torture during those five years. And um, I did a, a very comprehensive Istanbul protocol on, on this man. And later in 2015, the ACLU actually took up his case and um, brought a civil lawsuit against the two psychologists who um, engineered and actually um, implemented the enhanced, quote, enhanced interrogation program, unquote, um, that was used in the war on terror. This was a landmark case because this was the first time that um, a case had successfully gone forward um, of a person alleging torture by the US government. In all the other cases, the Justice Department was able to block the case and they were um, not allowed to proceed based on state secrets. The state secrets would be revealed if the case went forward. So this case went forward on behalf of three plaintiffs, um, two who were tortured, um, well, all three were tortured um, using the, the techniques that were approved by the government, including, um, but not limited to walling, confinement in cages, in small boxes, in coffin-like boxes, water suffocation, prolonged nudity, um, staying in cold places, um, food deprivation, force feeding, um, among other techniques. And one of the men, one of the plaintiffs actually died of hypothermia when he was chained to the floor um, in a cold room. So um, anyway, a group of experts um, evaluated these, the two plaintiffs that were still living and um, using the Istanbul protocol and um, determined that they suffered severe long lasting physical and psychological harm from these techniques, from the torture that they endured while in US custody. And um, the Istanbul protocol was paramount. I mean, it was so critical for this case, I think to be successful. Um, because we needed an instrument that was standardized, that was international, um, that, that adjudicators could understand 
And that's exactly what the Istanbul Protocol is. And um, it really helped us to, it helped me as one of the evaluators to create that link between the allegations of torture and the actual harm that I found um, in, in the man that, that I evaluated. So that was um, fantastic that, you know, we were, we were able to use the Istanbul protocol and create such powerful reports. And certainly um, the, the lawyers for the two psychologists tried to impeach my testimony <laughs> as well as others, uh, but they couldn't. The, the Istanbul protocol um, stood strong and they were unable to, to break us. So the Istanbul protocol lays out directions for how to um, interview survivors, for how to um, assess allegations of physical and psychological trauma in detail. Um, it, it's a how-to guide. And um, I think the most important thing, and this is what I teach, is it also um, helps you to think through the case and come to a, an analysis, to synthesize an analysis and conclusion and really create that nexus for the adjudicators of the allegations and the findings. Were the findings related to what the allegations were? And it really lays out a roadmap for how to do that. And that's not something we learn in medical school. And it's not something I think, um, Without, without a guide like that, it would be very difficult to do because we don't get formal training in most cases for how to do this. And I think the other parts of the Istanbul protocol that are so important is it actually goes through ethics um, and ethical issues that might arise. And all of those ethical issues have come up for me and I've gone to the Istanbul protocol and you know, what do you do when somebody's in prison and they might, um, there might be um, repercussions for them um, for having an evaluation done. I don't even, it, it, I don't want to use the word Bible, but it, it's, it's really what I go to. It's the most important tool in my toolbox for doing human rights work. I aspire um, to a world with no torture. And I think what the Istanbul Protocol has taught me that there can be accountability um, for people, even in um, when you're going up against the US and the CIA. So I, I think it's, um, it's a tool that we can use to aspire to that world. Well, I'm so excited um, for the for the updated version that I um, was was involved with. I think it's it's been just a tremendous tremendous piece of work with so many people involved and, and just enormous effort by by everyone. Um, I absolutely see it as um, a very as I said before a very important tool for documentation of of alleged torture, cruel and human and degrading treatment and for holding people accountable, um, including governments. So I, you know, plan to continue in my work, especially in the US now with, with survivors of the US program. I think the one thing I would like to see is, is more broad training um, amongst clinicians. And even if they don't do it, even if they can't have, don't do evaluations, everybody should know what it is. Um, and if they come across a situation where somebody has alleged ill treatment in prison or by the police or somewhere else, they at least know the steps they can take to make a referral um, and know that the Istanbul protocol exists and can be used. Yeah, I think what makes it more, that will make it much more effective is that, you know, we now had, what, um, 20 years of, of using it. And 
all of the people involved in in this update um, have just incredible input as to how we can make it better because we've all been using it and we all you know working out the glitches and um, it's really talented and smart people I think that we're um, involved in updating and it's going to be easier to use and I think there's a lot of new information in there that's um, going to be so helpful. I think it somehow should be inserted into all medical school curricula. I mean, not how to use it or do reports, but um, a human rights and anti-torture um, has to be part of medical training. 